Hello and welcome to BIOS Builders. We're thrilled to welcome Mark DePristo and Peyton Greenside from Big Hat Biosciences to the show today. Thank you once again for joining us. Let's kick things off, Big Hat team. Mark, can you start with a brief introduction? Thank you so much, Chris. We're delighted to be here. And my background has been at the intersection of bio and tech for about 20 years. I was a math computer science undergrad at Northwestern, which I came to from my hometown of Ames, Iowa. Uh, after uh, winning a Marshall Fellowship, I went to England and got a PhD in biochemistry, really got the bug on learning biology after that. So I uh, was at Harvard for a few years doing experimental work on in cancer model systems, left academia to join LEK Consulting, where I met the future big hat chief business officer, Liz Schwartzbach. But at the time, a good friend of mine was at the Broad Institute and these new next-gen sequencers arrived. He offered me you know, an opportunity to come and work with him. And I spent 10 years then working on next-gen sequencing, first at the Broad and then uh, an autism startup with Stan Lapidus and finally at uh, Google's AI division uh, until we founded Big Hat in 2019. Thank you, Mark. Peyton, what about yourself? Sure. So I'm from North Carolina, and actually my background in many ways mirrors Mark's. So I did my undergrad in applied math uh, at Harvard, come to biology after that, to an MPhil in computational biology at, at Cambridge, and came to Stanford for my PhD in bioinformatics. I also worked at the Broad Institute and, and also at, at Google Life Sciences, where I met Mark. And a lot of my work is focused on how do you um, build and interpret models of biological sequences, of DNA and protein sequences, and you know, often being in the passenger seat along with the uh, uh, experimentalist in terms of sort of see seeing what comes out and, you know, I've been really excited to kind of get into the driver's seat and say, how do we actually design sequences? And so did a, a Schmidt Science Fellowship on developing methods, machine learning methods to actually design sequences to fulfill multiple criteria of interest, mostly focused on kind of what's called active learning or patient optimization. And I was chatting quite a bit uh, with Mark about that. And ultimately, a lot of those conversations spun into uh, Big Cat, which we, as Mark mentioned, founded in, in 2019. Before we dive deeper into that, Mark, can you give us a brief intro of what Big Hat Biosciences is? Sure. So our mission at Big Hat is to design better biologics to improve human health using AI. And let me just unpack that a little bit. So what do we mean by better biologics or just antibodies and other protein therapeutics that are safer and more effective than what we can develop today? We're doing this for human health. We're a therapeutics company. We're really focused on overcoming unmet needs for the very large number of diseases that have very large amounts of unmet need. Inside of Big Hat, we're very excited on everything from infectious diseases to oncology and, and, and inflammation. And really what the foundation of Big Hat has been on a technology platform that has two pillars. Really one is this AI system that we have that is able to introduce mutations into antibodies that'll improve their properties. And we're able, we have the technologies that Peyton was allu alluding to, and I'm sure we'll talk in more detail about, that learn the relationship between mutations to an antibody and, and the properties that matter clinically. And we have this machine learning technology that's coupled to a custom built synthetic biology wet lab that allows us to synthesize these molecules we think are, are better, make, make them in cell-free mixtures, purify them, and then characterize them and we can do that very rapidly at a hundreds to soon thousands of antibodies every week. And these two technologies collaborate to let us make better molecules quickly. Peyton, can you expand on that a bit for us and talk a little bit more at a high level about Big Hat's approach and the platform you're building? Sure, so as Mark said, we really care actually about speed and getting feedback essentially which is reducing the time from hypothesis or, for example, a molecular design to feedback on, is that actually better? Is that worse? And so the two core kind of pillars of that technology are um, a high-speed wet lab. So how quickly and how accurately can we essentially confirm our hypotheses, measure everything we need to know about a, an antibody to know whether it will be a better you know, clinical candidate or not, as well as kind of the, the machine learning side, the, the computational side, which says, how, how do we take what we know about an antibody and kind of model from a sequence to a property? And how do we constantly build what we have uh, learned kind of about the sequence determinants of, of those properties and, and kind of transfer those? How do we you know, learn 
from a large corpus of sequences that go to the big hat lab and, and use that to design better sequences. So those technologies, the high throughput, um, high speed experimental and the um, computational, which is sort of modeling collectively, uh, all these properties are paired together. And so how do we take those and we make them actually work together, not sort of in different sides of the company, but actually work together and turn the crank between them uh, very rapidly. And so, you know, in many ways, like oh, the, the algorithms we use are holistic and we, we take this kind of view that the whole process is actually a uh, lab process. I mean, is critical to understand, to know, understand how well an antibody is going to perform. You can think about, for example, like measuring antibody yield. And if you want to know if mutation is going to make a higher yielding antibody, you know, you can basically measure that, but maybe the variance in your assay, right, is, you know, going to be so large that you can't get a, a clear measurement. So you want to measure actually everything you can about the experimental process, everything you can about the sequence and to do that in a, a well-engineered process. And so we, we really think about you know, treating everything as a, an engineering problem at Big Hat and, and, and bridging basically these two sides of the world to try to um, engineer these better molecules and more complex molecules than the antibodies you see, see today. And it sounds like you're both, if not uniquely uh, placed to do that, very well placed together based on your backgrounds from before. So let's dive a little bit more into that origin story. You have backgrounds in applying chem, uh, computational and statistical techniques to biomedical challenges in academia and in industry. In 2009, you brought those approaches together to launch Big Hat. And earlier this year, you raised your Series A from a cadre of really phenomenal investors. Mark, let's take a step back. Can you tell us more about the genesis of the invention that kickstarted Big Hat? What was the spark that really started it all? That's a, a great question. And, and I think. I think it's important to understand sort of the, the history that led Peyton and I to a common frustration that ultimately became Big Hat. You know, I think for both of us, it was very clear in 2016, 2017, that this AIML technologies, which really is deep learning technologies, um, were the real deal. This is a real breakthrough. And it was clear, you know, both of us were, I think you were at Stanford at that point, I was at Google. And it was clear they were revolutionizing kind of everything that people were throwing at them. But still the impact in the life sciences was pretty muted to be totally honest. We looked around and, and you know, there were cool papers, but it wasn't like the field was changing as much as the impact was happening in tech. And I think both of us were frustrated, you know, why, why is this happening? And I think our, our observation, our diagnosis of the, of the cause was that the AI ML tech was trapped as an analysis tool. It was trapped at the end of experiments. Right? You, you do these big experiments, you generate these beautiful data sets, which was transformative. I mean, you learn a lot of biology by doing that, but then the machine learning tech is, is trapped producing, you know, learning the patterns of that data and digesting it. And that's very useful if you want to learn the biology, but it's really not closing the loop. It's not having the impact on the next round of experiments. Because you, you basically have to publish a paper, hope somebody who's an experimentalist reads that, thinks it's interesting, does some experiments. It's like, that's a multi-year cycle. It's really very, very long. And our view is that the solution to that, to bring the impact was really to integrate these two things together. You, need, you needed to focus the AI, bring it into the product. And so the example that people I think of is like Gmail's autocomplete. You know, that came out when I was at Google. It's, I mean, it's, it's powered by AI tech, but it's directly in the product. Like your actual use of the product is enhanced by the AI. And that's just not, not there in, in the life sciences in 2017, 18, 19, when we were looking around. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is there's a focus on slow but high throughput data generation in the life sciences. So people set up large experiments that collect a lot of data. So data generation per time seems high, but it actually is a hugely punctuated. It's like there's six months between experiments, but these experiments generate a lot of data when they come in. And that's great for producing a lot of data, but it's not really great for the AI ML. They, don't, they really want feedback. And in particular, they wanna be able to propose new things that get checked quickly. And in some sense, that's why tech has been so impactful. Sorry, AI has been impactful in tech because you can directly see if people like the Gmail autocomplete, like they either click on the computer or not. You're really directly getting this feedback. So our vision that really led to Big Hat was, well, how do we combine AI ML with data generation in the life sciences? And we zoomed in on the problem that we focus on an antibody design and optimization because 
it was very clear that protein modeling is transforming with the AI ML tech. I mean, AlphaFold is an example of that. You know, there's synthetic biology technologies didn't even exist five years ago that we use to build and test these proteins. And we were able to combine them in a platform that would really move the needle for antibody design and engineering. As an engineer by training myself, a lot of what you're saying resonates and is also very exciting. So Peyton, tell us more about how you came together as co-founders. How do you feel like you and Mark coming from such similar backgrounds also complement each other? That's a great question. I think we actually really started talking about this, uh, I guess, concretely when I was uh, applying for the Schmidt Science Fellowship and I kind of kind of wrote a draft of what I wanted to see, which is actually, you know, I want to start thinking about what these methods would look like that could design, right? That could take information and huge areas of uncertainty, which is the case in biology, and try to figure out like how to design something that's better than what kind of exists, you know, design better protein sequences. And so I said this to Mark and, you know, it's like, yeah, what, what do you think, you know? And, and Mark took uh, a read of it and said, oh, actually, I've been, I've been thinking in the same direction. And sort of, oh, okay. So we started chatting, you know, what, what does it look like? You know, he'd been thinking on, on similar themes. And I think we were both in places in academia and industry where, you know, they each had great, you know, I, I would say assets, but still couldn't kind of put together the paradigm that we wanted to see, right? Which was engineering from the ground up, kind of this, these two cultures, these two parts of what we would need, the experimental, the computational to, to work well together. And that's something you have to kind of build from, from scratch in many ways. It's kind of hard to either you know, I would say sort of tech focus, as Mark's saying, and kind of add on a lab, right? Sort of uh, to, to just kind of post add that or to start from, the, start from the experimental side and sort of add on an ML component. It's it really, it's are, these are complex problems that really kind of have to be solved kind of from scratch and from, from creation. And so we were chatting about what that would look like and where we think we could actually, you know, see what we want to realize in the world in terms of how those kind of, those two worlds interact and, and kind of synergize. And also, what came out of that is a, a conviction, you know, I think that we really felt like we do this and specifically in protein design. I mean, we looked at many areas, right? And many experiments you look at and they're really, you know, it's like two months to design some sequences. You're designing kind of guide RNAs, you have to do sequencing. There's a lot of areas that are really, really promising, but also, you know, not as conducive. And we were really excited by, by protein design because, you know, we can really, with cell resynthesis, we can produce an antibody, you know, in a few hours, truly, and enough to, to test whether or not it's actually better or worse. So. You know, it was it was a long discussion, not just in terms of the paradigm, but also the practicalities of you know uh, the um, the area and the problem we wanted to solve. You know, algorithmically, experimentally, we even put a simulator together, right, Mark? It was that was what actually would we would we uh, do when we first kind of got funding and to, exactly. to prove ourselves exactly. this would work. And yeah, so you know, I think that that kind of shared um, vision for what we actually wanted to see in terms of how kind of experimental and, and machine learning experimental science and machine learning came together was what we kind of shared. And, you know, it's funny, our, our backgrounds are uh, in many ways very similar, but I think we, we complement each other in a lot of ways. So Mark was actually an experimentalist and, and did his kind of PhD and, you know, also has focused a lot more on the software side. And I think I was coming a lot more from sort of the machine learning side and, and, and both have a, a shared background in computational biology. So it's funny that even though in many ways our backgrounds are similar, we've actually kind of focused on different kind of uh, uh, lenses of, of different problems. And, and that's been actually like hugely valuable having that shared language, but also kind of different backgrounds in many ways. Um, we also sort of worked on different problems historically and in the past. And, and I think just, uh, you know, computational biology is not a narrow field, it's a huge field. And so you may have worked on totally different problems with totally different tools, despite being, uh, being in the same field. But we both, I think, you know, very seriously value, I think like rigorous technology and, you know, I, I think also kind of the culture that we wanted to see, we had a very strong shared vision around that. And, that's been, uh, I guess, huge, and, and especially like how we think about growing big cat. Exactly, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think this idea that you, you that you have to be complementary perfectly is not correct. I mean, I think yeah. we were like mutually reinforcing. Yeah, that's and, a good way to put it. <laughs> shared enough shared experience and value to understand what where we want to go, and it helps to have a partner who's enthusiastic about that future yeah. and can sort of help lift it up, right? I mean, it's, it's a heavy lift. It's useful to have multiple people. Yeah, it's interesting because people think about complementarity in many ways of someone does business, right? Or someone does science or someone, you know, in these kinds of very, you know, broad strokes. But it's funny because I think we both, you know, we're both very excited about like, kind of learning like the full stack, right? Of what we, what we need to do to build a company and actually can, like, it's wonderful to have these kinds of discussions on all areas because of that shared background and, and kind of, you know, sometimes we have different perspectives, sometimes the same and be able to discuss that. And it is true. I think many people who found companies are actually more different on, on the surface, but it's been one of the best parts, I think, of kind of building Big Hat is having a lot of that shared shared background. Exactly. We have a shared language. We know, yeah. both of us know what these AI are <laughs> supposed to do, right? Like, you yeah. know, you're not 
just a word, right? Like, you know, both yeah. of us have written those things. We've written software. We've done the biology. It's a, it's, it's very valuable to have that shared framework because it's very hard to build a company, to build a technology, to explain why it's valuable. And that really to distill it down so you know is, is, is hard. And it's great to have someone who really gets it as a partner. Great. I was going to save this. I think we were going to talk about it later, but I hope you'll for, forgive me as you're talking about this now that mutually shared understanding and framework. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how do you extend that across the company, especially as you start to grow now? Because if you have that shared language together, how do you ensure everyone else shares that language with you as well? That has been, I would say, one of our priorities since founding. In fact, I think there's no two people at Big Ad. In fact, Mark and I probably have more similar backgrounds than just about anyone else at the company, to be honest, <laughs> um, which is one, one interesting uh, anecdote. But, you know, we spent a lot of time spending, you know, in meetings translating, making sure everyone understands. In fact, we had this kind of, a, uh, you know, I guess very, very simple, like, words where I'm sort of saying, oh, like the big hat works selling, you know, someone who has an automation background or had a platform sort of like, ah, oh, that means something different to me. Or someone, you know, wants to say, we even had questions around like, you know, simulated data. What does that mean for an experimentalist and versus for someone in machine learning versus data science? And like, you know, every single word, you know, got some other nuance. And, and so it's funny because every single meeting essentially at Big Hat is, is across like every discipline we have kind of software represented machine learning, data science, you know, lab science, et cetera. And so there's constant translation. We're not having like the lab do this and they, they pass that over to kind of the data science side. It's, it's wholly integrated from the ground up. And so I think we have uh, in many ways built an incredible team who, who, who loves that. I mean, they, they essentially spend a lot of time enjoying learning like what that language is, how to think about, you know, what kind of data would, as a lab person would I generate for data scientists, what would they want to see, you know, or vice versa, like, you know, how can experimentalists change what they're doing, right, to inform what I'm doing on the machine learning side, etc. And I think a lot of kudos to the team we built, I mean, they really, uh, I think, internalize and help grow that culture. And, and I think there's very few people actually who are doing something that they've done before in the sense of, you know, everyone has a, a core competency, but people come from all over, from evolutionary biology, from genomics, you know, from, uh, you know, different engineering fields. And, and we've had people actually, in fact, many uh, data scientists, software engineers who started as experimentalists, and now they want to, you know, go into a new area and are tremendously succeeding in that. So I think, you know, it's really, I think, part of our our culture and, and uh, something that our team has really, really, uh, I think, uh, amplified is that, you know, everyone can be great at something, but wants to learn something else and is really eager to build those relationships. And it really comes down to the people, in my opinion. Yes, totally. And I think the, you could just see the energy in the team because it's not a, it's, it's no longer just words saying, oh yeah, we have ML. Like the experimentalists are working with the AI ML team members and they're collectively deciding what to test, what is feasible to do? How do, what kind of assays do we set up and how do they relate to learning? And it's just a very energizing thing to really understand, oh, okay, like this thing is going to make predictions on what mutations to change. Okay. That, that makes conceptual sense. And then how do I give it the data that it needs to learn that? And, and there's really a, a back and forth happening. And I think it's, as Peyton was saying, this was like the key challenge early on. How do we get this system up and running without silos appearing? And I think after two years, we're pretty happy with the fact that there really aren't silos. So it's really project-based work that really incorporates everyone. Oh, it sounds like a phenomenal place to, to be working, especially in such an interdisciplinary and cross-functional team, for, for lack of a better term. So let's expand a little bit on those core competencies that you've been talking about, not just in your employees, but also at Big Hat in, in the team more broadly itself. At Big Hat, you're reimagining antibody development using the help of AI and machine learning technologies, just as you described, using data-driven discovery as your primary tool. So let's take a step back and talk more about the platform, or a step back from the platform, and rather talk about the unmet need that Big Hat seeks to address. What brought you to this challenge? What is this uh, unmet need? Yeah, that is a great question. And I think really to understand it, it's useful to just start with the, the sort of the history of antibodies, to really understand how this worked. So the technology of early antibodies very quickly focused on kind of immunization of humanized mice or humanized, or pulling antibodies out of human blood. It really, you can think about this as an evolution toward natural product discovery, right? You're pulling a molecule that's created out of an organism who is a black box for all intents and purposes, how that really works. And, but you're able to pull and identify molecules you think are attractive. 
And then there's been a trajectory, this has sort of led us down this route of less and less manipulation, right? Like you'll change the mouse's immune system to be human, but then you get what you get from the mouse's blood and you really don't manipulate it because it's humanized antibody. So that's been an incredibly successful trajectory for developing lots of drugs for which binding to something that looks like an antigen is the key component of the drug. But in many ways, that vision of like, oh, I'm just going to bind to this receptor and, and then the drug is going to work. Like we've kind of found many of those, you know, that was the big push over the last 20 to 30 years with the antibody tech. And so a lot of what we see is really the breakthrough drugs. And certainly the FDA sees it that way because many of them are getting breakthrough status is, is not in just vanilla MABs, but in designer antibodies, antibodies that are bispecifics or bites. They're CARs for the CAR T therapies. And these are the total opposite of a natural product. These are wildly engineered. And so we've painted ourselves into a little bit of a corner, right? Like we've developed amazing technologies to make vanilla maps super well. But we, those technologies and their investment has made it hard for us to engineer anything else really. And, and so there's this, there's been in a growing gap between what you can do if you don't want to manipulate the antibody and what you need to do if you want to change it a lot and make it into, say, a car, or car for a car team. And so that's really the layers of unmet need start there. That, that discordance, that gap between what we can do with the natural product approach versus what we really need for the engineering. And so you can think about it as some of the areas that we're focused on the unmet need was control. You know, we want the ability to change the properties of an antibody as needed for therapeutic indication. So this is a simple example of like, maybe you need the antibody to be more stable because you want to make it an inhalable. Like, you know, do you, you don't really, you shouldn't have to engineer a new mouse with a higher average thermal temperature coming out of its uh, immune system. Like, that's just not reasonable. You've got to be able to take something and stabilize it if you need. You know, Really, you could think about it as, in general, what we're trying to change is from a discovery science, like you are good at discovering which antibody is best in this pool of antibodies, to an engineering discipline. Given an antibody, I can systematically transform it into one that has the properties that I, I pre-specified and cared about. Like, I wanted to be stable. I wanted to have a high score on this cell-based functional assay, because I think that'll tell me that it's clinically valuable. And so, really, that's that layer is really about control. Like I need to be able to make the molecules I want with the properties I want quickly and effectively. Then really the second layer is just today's designs, right? will benefit from this sort of solving that because we'll be able to make faster molecules and we'll be able to make them better because we will say like, oh yes, you've got good molecules along these four dimensions, but this fifth dimension we didn't do so well on. So let's improve it. So now you have a better overall molecule and we can do that really fast. So that's sort of the second layer, really, making today's process faster and producing better molecules out of it. But really, you know, you can think about a big hat is already focusing more and more on this third layer of opportunity of designing not for affinity, which is to first approximation what the immune system is trying to do when you do create an antibody with immunization. And instead, design for function. You know, we want an antibody to do complicated things, like bind to this surface receptor, aggregate it away, get it into the endosome and have it de get destroyed. Like that is not the same thing as what's happening in humanized mice or in your, in your blood. So we really think more and more about how do I design for function? How do we make a molecule that does what we want biologically? And really that's exciting at Big Hat because the technologies we're developing, these, these general purpose machine learning algorithms that can improve affinity or stability, they can improve kind of anything we can measure. And in, in the long run, what we really want is precision molecular engineering. We pre-specify all the properties. We identify the most reasonable proxies for biological effectiveness of the drug. And we optimize to exactly that set of things. And we'll measure it as best we can and produce the best molecule we can in a kind of deterministic engineering oriented way. <laughs> so really the big vision at Big Hat is, is shifting drug discovery from discovery to an engineering discipline. 
And that's in part really because targets are increasingly known, right? There's no magic cancer target out there. We did TCGA and all these projects, they're not there, right? Like we know that you've got to work with what we're given and the way cancer behaves. And so the challenge is to really to make the most effective molecule against the existing known targets. And that's just increasingly true as we get more genomics data, bigger data in bio. And it's the reason that, for instance, you can think about an example like breast cancer therapeutics. We've had mul multiple generations of breast cancer antibodies, many of which are breakthroughs in and of themselves. And they're all against the same target. It's just that we were doing a much better job of specifically targeting that thing, being effective when we get it, we're binding all the right epitopes. We're, each, each one of these is, is transforming the care of, an in, of the next generation of patients. And so we think that that's more and more the future of drug development. So to do this, it's been said that to build on the vision you're talking about, Mark, and honestly, it's really exciting. Big Hat is bringing together synthetic biology, machine learning, and automation to offer a general, reliable, fast, and flexible platform for the engineering of antibody therapeutics. So Peyton, can you tell us more about the platform in detail? How is engineering antibodies enabled? What novel applications are you guys really making possible going beyond just the vision and the overview Mark described? Sure, sure. So I'll give you a bit of a, how to think about the platform and then I think, you know, what's, what it's enabled or uh, what's enabled through them. So the platform actually can be thought of quite simply. Number one, you have to have sort of an antibody to start, right? You either discover that, we can discover that, a partner can discover that, you know, an academic group can discover that. And then there's a very simple process that the Big Hat platform follows. We take that molecule, we develop kind of models, and we propose with those models what mutations to make. What, what mutations, what should I change about the sequence that I think will improve the properties that I care about? And the properties that I care about, as Mark said, it's not just affinity, right? We care about onboarding everything that we can to the platform that tells us how well a molecule or an antibody will perform in the therapeutic context. So we take a sequence, we propose mutations, and then we validate what is the effect of those mutations on everything we can measure. And that's not affinity, that's you know, any number of functional assays that we can that give us a better uh, sense of the therapeutic context. That's biophysics, developability, manufacturability, et cetera. And we measure all that in the lab, at Big Ed, in house. Everything we measure is in house. We take that data, we cycle that back to our models, and we say, great, what, what did I learn? Is this better? Is this worse? Were my models correct? Were they wrong? How far off were they quantitatively? And we update them and we repeat. So we have a goal, right, to get to an improved, you know, 10x and several orders of magnitude, magnitude improvement in, in function. And we repeat and we repeat and we repeat, repeat and we repeat until we hit those um, design criteria that we want. And so in many ways, the paradigm is simple, which is measure what you can, model what you can, and sort of improve that every iteration as you go. But in reality, I, you know, it comes down to an engineering challenge to do that effectively, which is, you know, we care very deeply about the variance of our assets, of how, you know, modular the platform is, where, you know, some um, assays may matter for certain indications, but not. You know, how do we very easily pass an antibody through everything we need in the platform to measure how well it's going to work um, in, in the downstream therapeutic context? And eventually, you know, obviously, uh, you know, uh, what we can do in very one, you know, several day cycle uh, at, at Big Hat, you know, there's downstream. Uh, needs too, which is how does this actually work in animals? You know, do you have to, you know, you can start with, for example, improving murine or synovial cross reactivity, and then eventually, as we promote leads from this optimization, this core, you know, cycle that I've described, you know, then we can go downstream to animal studies and, and looking at the effects of those. But the core big hat cycle is really kind of where we think about measuring and optimizing every, everything we can to give this molecule the best chance of success for downstream preclinical and then clinical development. So what that enables actually is, is the interesting question. And that allows us in, in broad strokes to say, you know, we can actually define an, an antibody much more broadly. You know, as Mark was saying, everyone thinks about an antibody as a map, right? What your body actually produces. But there's tons of opportunity in, in what a map could be. Multi, crazy multi-specifics that an animal actually won't be able to produce natively. Or for example, you know, uh, antibodies that are really conditionally active in, in certain conditions in, in the body. And so, you know, we can take these engineering challenges that you can't just do in sort of one round, right? You propose mutation or this or that, and you might get lucky, but the reality is, you know, you're, you're testing a very tiny space of everything that's possible. And the chance you're going to get really lucky and that's the perfect molecule, that's pretty unlikely, right? So you like, uh, you know, uh, all probability is you'll get something that looks decent, but you know, you probably want it to be better. You're gonna have to improve it and, and, and not just one, but probably multiple axes. And so, you know, we can sort of think, you know, I would say really creatively about what would the next generation of antibodies look like? Because we can do multiple rounds of iteration. We can try something and we can, you know, cycle a dozen times, two dozen times to try to make that. And when you are really limited to cycles that are several months long, 
that's really hard to do, right? You're really trapped in kind of what exists and what's been produced natively. And so I really, you know, I think we're really excited about this vision of if an antibody is not just what a mouse produces, right, when you immunize it, but what you could imagine, something that binds and, and, and activates, or, or I should say, just carries out the function you want, so you have to be activated. What would that look like? And so we're really excited to pursue a lot of these next generation antibody kind of opportunities that have been out of the reach of traditional engineering techniques. It honestly sounds like every grad student's dream. <laughs> I'd be curious <laughs> to hear, going, going back to my own grad school days when I was doing some protein engineering, and I'd be curious to understand uh, if and when it'll be available more broadly or if this is something you plan to keep in-house. But um, for now, I know that with the platform scaling capacity, is, as you both mentioned, and you're targeting, I think, a hundredfold in the next few years, and you've talked about a little bit of this already, but what are some of the novel applications that you're hoping uh, will be made available, especially because you've talked about different specific antibody properties? And what we've, what at least my limited experience has told me in the past is that as you engineer one and you make it and you improve, you might find another gets a little bit harder to control. So how do you bring all of these together? That's a, a great question. So just, you know, just to sort of give some concrete numbers to what is really a relative increase is the first sort of prototype of the platform, which we, we built, you know, in early 2020, has about 100 antibody a week capacity. And we're, we're sort of halfway to the 100x scale up of that, you know, we're approaching 1000 in 2022. And we think that it's technically feasible to get to kind of 10,000 with our platform design and, and, and other sorts of innovations. We sort of already are on the roadmap. So you can think about it as like, what do you do if you can design and characterize 1,000 to 10,000 antibodies a week where you have base pair perfect design, right? It's not a random assortment. You really can go and make exactly what you want. And in some sense, it's an extension of the problem that we had on day one, which is it was very clear that this pl platform we were building in a very broad surface area. I mean, it, it could work on antibodies, it could work on proteins. You know, our first conference publication was really talking about optimizing the stoke shift of GFP with this platform. So it has a very broad surface area. And so we've been struggling in some sense with this question from day one. What do we do with all of this design capacity? The truth of the matter is I think we just continue to allocate our capacity to a mixture of partnerships, we love working with existing biotherapeutic and biotechnology companies to help advance their molecules. And we have a growing and a really rapidly growing internal pipeline of molecules. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of those. So on the partner side, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. We, we would love to work with every antibody company out there that has, that could make use of this advanced sort of tunable property optimization. And it's not unreasonable. There are thousands of antibodies in development today, and, and many of them could benefit from a technology like Big Hats. So we think about this accelerating more molecules that are better to patients as fast as possible. And, and, and that's, that's hugely valuable for patients. It's hugely valuable for our partners, and it's, it's, it's great for Big Hat. You know, we learn a lot. We get, our platform gets more use. It gets better with use. We expand the suite of, of standard assays through this. And so we grow with sort of our partnerships on one arm. On the, on the other side, and, and this is really what the Series A sort of catalyzed, was we knew in the beginning of Big Hat that we, we could develop therapeutics ourselves, but we hadn't really broken ground on that. And we really hadn't, it hadn't permeated into our bones that we were going to need to do that. But now really after a year of, of heads down therapeutics work internally, we really, we, we understand exactly why we want to do this. And, and the argument is simple. Our internal programs stretch the capacity of the platform into areas that partners are not coming to us to work on because they don't yet know what is possible with Big Hat's platform. They don't set the goals based on what we think the platform, where the platform will be in two or three years. And so we've been building a a, a, a pipeline of our own therapeutics that's really focused on designs that are out of really cutting edge out of reach of what you could do with, uh, without our platform. And if with more capacity, you know, what we'll do is we'll pursue even more programs in parallel. We already can do a lot of exciting kind of parallel work on many programs very effectively and efficiently. We'll do many, many more programs in parallel. 
we'll put more cycles into each program. So, you know, we have this unusual challenge that we sort of always can feel like we get a little bit better. Like every week that we keep the program live on the platform, more mutants will be created. The AIs get a little bit smarter. They get So like, we'll just let that run for longer if we have more capacity, because we'll have a lot more opportunity to, to, to pursue plenty of programs in parallel, each of which is longer. And we could see a, vi of, of a future where we're doing hundreds of, of exploratory projects translating into tens of therapeutic programs every year with this platform. And so those two things are you know, hugely exciting uh, opportunities for us because we will both partner with people to bring medicines to patients and we'll have really innovative new therapies and a whole bunch of different indications in-house. And then finally, I think the other side, and, and, and this is sort of implicit, but it's sort of, it's very important is we, we need to do a lot of technology development. You know, our platform is broad, but we've, for many, many reasons, focused almost exclusively on antibodies. And with more capacity, we'll expand into all sorts of other modalities like cars, peptides. These are all viable options on our, on our platform, but we're not investing in them today. And two, we'll, we'll, we can expand into new domains. You know, it's clear that diagnostic molecules and reagents of antibodies are, you know, the wild west in some sense. There's different antibodies with different affinities that may or may not cross-react correctly. Like that is a real area of opportunity. And as Peyton alluded to early on, you know, we looked at a lot of different areas where we could apply this platform. The best first application is clearly antibody tech. But, you know, we could be working on enzymes and in an industrial or agricultural context, we could make, you know, agricultural biologics, which I think is a very exciting area. So we'd really do more partnerships, more internal programs, and, and we expand the surface area of the platform even further. Let's talk a little bit more about those partnerships and a little bit more about the challenges and accomplishments you've seen, especially considering you've <laughs> launched a company and that's not something that's ever easy, but you've done so during a global pandemic while also attracting so many potential partners as you described. So when establishing Big Hat, how did you decide your commercialization strategy? As you were talking about, Mark, partnering versus internal programming versus licensing the platform and other, other options as well? I, th I think it's a great question. And I think Peyton and I have, you know, we talked a lot about this challenge early on. And I think, the, you know, the debates could go all over the place, right? Like they're very complicated. Like, how do you want to do this? But I think what helps is, is really a couple of things that, that really honed it down. One is what we're talking about building, it was a bunch of slides in the beginning, right? Like we, we said we could do this. So we had a long amount of, we really had to build an evidence base that this worked. And so really the first most important thing is to prove the tech, tech works. And biopharma and biotherapeutics development is, is, is hard. It's a, it's a big area and it's long. So you have to go to partnering in the beginning. You know, you've got to convince yourself that what you're building is valuable. And the best way to do that is to talk to the world leading companies in the area and see if you can work with them to improve the processes that they have. And if you can do that, you can really convince yourself, hey, that this what we're building is attractive. This is useful. Someone's willing to work with us to use it. It really validates the whole approach. And of course, it demonstrates in the fastest way that your technology is attractive, that it really works, it works on real problems, all of that. The other side of it, so, so that's sort of like partnering was clear. You gotta do partnering for us. The, the other side is, you come in, this is sort of the software engineering world leading through, but you, know, you got to eat your own dog food. You know, if, if we have an amazing technology for developing antibodies, why aren't we developing our own antibodies? Like why, you know, it, it's clear that that would be very valuable to do. So if you're not doing that, it sort of begs the question, why not? And so we really had it very quickly, this sense of like, we're going to have to eat our own dog food here. Like we're going to learn the most by using the platform to read real therapeutics in-house and really learn everything we have to do so that we can make molecules that really help people. And that it will improve the platform, the business, partnerships and other therapeutic programs. And ultimately, I would say the, the biggest driver of everything is just 
focusing on the therapeutics. You know, these are the highest value things to be doing. We've been really focused on making molecules that'll go into people in the long run. And that's really driving all of this, partnerships and programs in-house. And so during the last few years, what are some of the greatest challenges you faced? And as you navigate them, what have you learned? That's a great question. I can I can first stab and, and Mark, you can chime in. But I think one of the things, things we talked about earlier was one of the things we most cared about in the beginning, which is culture, right? Which is, I feel like, you know, I guess a lot of people say companies live and die by culture. And I think that's, you know, certainly true in our minds. And so trying, especially as COVID started just a few months after founding, completely, completely unanticipated us you know, trying to ensure that we really could be a company where the experimental side, the computational side, they were, you know, equal, they were working together, they were cross-functional, having the people to do that, having the processes to do that. It's not just people, right? you know, paving the way with process is one of the things we focus somewhat fanatically on in, in terms of, you know, what would it look like, right, to sort of be a, a data scientist, to both sort of work with wet lab in a way that, you know, makes sense for them, work with machine learning side, reach up, upstream, downstream, et cetera, and kind of, you know, speak both of those languages, make the bridge between those areas, kind of as someone maybe who sits in between and, you know, setting precedence for how, what that looks like to work on a cross-functional team in like a big hat way, quote unquote, because problems can be solved both, you know, the same problem can sometimes can be solved with data sciences with an experiment. You could do another experiment, or you can do some analysis, right? What do you do? Where do you put the time? That's not a discussion that any one person will solve. That's something that groups will solve. And trying to sort of instill in many ways like that that problem solver attitude, but now as a, at a group level across many disciplines is one of the things we focus on. But culture, I think that's what it boils down to is one of the things we worried about. COVID, we actually, <laughs> it was certainly a challenge. You know, I'd love to say, you know, we can never be in many ways remote entirely first because we have a lab, right? We have, you know, until the day that all the robots are running everything and there's no people, it's good. there's gonna be um, a lab at Big Hat, which I'd love to see, by the way. We, we head towards that, but they're always going to be sort of a group who is in the lab and a group who is remote. And I think, you know, we love that. We've embraced that, but it does come up with some challenges. How do you celebrate people's success when some people are remote, some people are present? How do you make sure that those conversations, you know, in the lab that someone who's working actively with that team, you know, needs to know about, but they're not kind of there. And, and I think a lot of that boils into uh, other cultural elements we were, we were really focused on. Staying focus is one thing also. I think we, as Mark said, we could in many ways do anything and that makes this problem quite hard, which is and not just we could do anything in terms of what we could work on, what molecule, like what indication and what modality, but also we could stop at any point. There's always one more week. There's always two more weeks. And I think this is a challenge that is a bit unique to our platform is how do you know when what you've done is good enough, when, when you're happy, when you want to move it forward, when you want to take the next step. And like, this is one of the things we really, we're blessed to have the challenge to uh, consider because given how easily we can kind of constantly iterate our, on our molecules. And so we've, we've put a lot of effort, I would say, into making sure that we can answer those questions. We have the processes again. It's not necessarily like a single rule that'll work everywhere, but actually a process of how to answer that question and when it comes about. And I, I think another, another challenge we face is we, we've, you know, very, very deeply, I guess, care about, you know, I guess avoiding the hype machine that's been, I think, somewhat uh, problematic and and sort of the ML and bio world, I would say across in many ways, like the sort of machine learning um, applications. And, you know, we really quiet in the beginning. We wanted to make sure that we could prove to ourselves, prove to partners, prove to people, advisors, uh, that we really believed in what we were doing. And in many ways, I think that was both easy and hard to do, I guess I should say. You know, uh, we felt like, especially with COVID, right, we could, we could work on this very quickly. We ended up doing that, right? We wanted to make sure that we, you know, work on something that was meaningful. We knew what we were going to do with that and with, with, for example, a COVID therapeutic and, you know, being very careful about what problems we want to tackle from what context. Is this internal development? Is this like a therapeutic program? And, and just being very deliberate about what we're doing and why and trying to communicate that. We've spent a lot of time thinking about how to do that well. And Mark, I'm sure has other uh, aspects. No, I think well. that's exactly right. I mean, I think maybe the, the best way I, I could sort of summarize this is we struggled for a long time also because it, it just not comparing yourself with others, right? Like you got to succeed on your own terms. We, you know, at the, on one hand, there was COVID. This was very difficult. On the other hand, there was this mass IPO boom in biotech and people making, you know, going public after founding the company a year earlier. And, you know, you have to really, it was hard to be like, look, we're, we're going to talk about our actual accomplishments when they happen. Not when we do, you know, do a deal, but like when we've actually started to succeed on that deal, and and that's just been really hard. But I have to say, I, I now that we're reaping the fruits of that, I, I feel like uh, this was definitely the right decision. It's nice to come out of the gate talking about what you've done with real, actual working examples, as opposed to sort of the the, the hope that you'll have something. 
I think for my, just speaking purely for myself, I also really appreciate that approach. And I also really value the way, uh, Peyton, you started by talking all about the people. I know that's something we highlighted earlier about the culture, and it seems like it's an area where you've both and Big Hat as a whole has really mm -hmm. decided to focus. And that's always great to see in a startup. Uh, yeah, we've had uh, no regretted departures in, th in the whole life of the company. So this has been really a pleasure. So it's, it's yeah, and we can't, I mean, you know, I have to say, we, we want to make sure that everyone is productive and happy. And in some sense, that's really, I would say, is the, you know, if you have to say, what's Big Hat's biggest triumph is that we've really, we've been a stable home for our employees in a very chaotic time. You know, we provided really a, a place for people to be, even, even if it was, you know, over Zoom to talk about, you know, a, co a continuous goal that lasted through this pandemic. You know, we were able to grow these technologies and this challenging thing. And I think, it, you know, it just created this real sense of like, hey, we've got something that's continuing despite the, the, the chaos of, of 2020 and 21. I'd love to dive a little bit further into some of those other triumphs. Mark, I know, as you mentioned, creating that stable home is, is important. If you want to highlight maybe one or two more sure, for our I audience think, um, and yourselves. I would say, you know, one is there was a period of time where all this stuff was, you know, simulations and ideas that Peyton and I had. And, you know, the, to see it actually work is amazing. Like it really, it really works. <laughs> it's, that's it's just so exciting. And it really works because we've had the pleasure of hiring a, a truly amazing team. You know, we have nearly 30 people on staff now. They're Across, across every area, they're fabulous, world leading, but also they're all open minded and, and excited by the by all the different things that we're doing. It, it, it's really uh, it's really uh, every day I feel blessed by this, um, and I think that's been great. You know, we've had uh, we think we've created a culture where people generally don't leave. There's a great work-life balance. We hugely prioritize that. As, as you saw at the start of this thing, by three young kids. So we, we make sure that people can be productive, but not, you know, burn out in the, in the startup because it, it's very high intensity. And, it's, you know, it, it's reasonable to do a certain amount of work and then take time off. So an, an example is, like, we shut down the company over the holidays. You know, we, the lab shut down, no emails, no Slack, everything gone, and people got a real break. 10 days and they come back energized. And you can feel the energy return on this. And so we really care about this. And it's been super exciting to, to, to see the growth from a bunch of slides to signing our first partners, to start to succeed on those partnerships, to attract our top investors and, and really uh, just to see the machine that we're trying to build sputtering to life and seeing its future as like this well-oiled engine creating therapeutics all the time. Well, speaking of that future, maybe in each of your own words, what's coming next for Big Hat? I can start and then Mark, you can, you can uh, add on, but I think, you know, we, I think have been quite deliberate in how we built Big Hat. You know, you know, we both, uh, coming from largely computational backgrounds, had a lot of confidence in the, in the computational side, the algorithmic side, and spent started with essentially the lab. We can't validate, right, what we're predicting, then, you know, wh where's Big Cat? This model isn't going to work. Sort of starting with a lab, adding on the computational side, data science, machine learning, et cetera, closing the loop. And then, you know, what's, what's coming is kind of what's upstream and downstream of that. And I would say, importantly, what is now basically turning that platform and that, that technical capacity into a drug development machine, you know, showing the value of the molecules we produce, moving those farther into preclinical development, link clinical development, and, and really building the drug development arm with the technology we have. And that's really the next phase of it. Kind of what we're, we're focusing a lot on is spending a lot of our uh, attention on in-house. And I think, you know, we're going to basically also be going kind of upstream in the platform, not just in terms of improving the cycle, improving the speed, improving the throughput, adding new assets, but actually going upstream in terms of discovery and sort of technology innovation and, and more work in sort of cell -based synthesis and larger scale production and really enveloping the core work cell and the core paradigm in a full and you know end to end antibody engineering capability that leads all the way through you know the the later preclinical and clinical developments. We're very excited about that, and I think that's really the value that we're reaching towards. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, we're basically building what we think of as a universal machine for designing protein-based therapeutics, 
and we've got it sort of up and running now. We're tweaking it. We're adding, you know, major components, but the fundamentals of it are starting to to turn. And it's uh, really, I love, yeah, the next years are just using it, improving it, making it really work well. I'm excited to see what comes next. And I know there are so many questions I would love to ask in addition, but being respectful of your time, recognizing that we are just coming back off from the holidays. Let's close things off. Are there any additional uh, thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? How can we learn more about your work? I mean, I think, you know, we are growing, <laughs> we are hiring many people, people, we're excited to collaborate. And I think we'd love to engage both academically with industry partners. You know, I, I think we're, we'd love to hear from you if you think this is a technology that you'd be excited to work with. Feel free to reach out. Yes, absolutely. At bighatbio.com, you know, you can visit our YouTube channel. And then as Peyton said, we're, we are hiring. We would love to speak to people who want to join the team and help us advance this vision of a universal drug development machine. All right. Thank you, Mark and Peyton, for an absolutely fantastic episode. We are very grateful for your time. Happy New Year to, your boat, to you both, to our audience. And thank you again. Thank, thank you so much for having us.